just to give you a little background, this has been done at the uh, Bowl Expo with the NCAA conferences and also the USBC coaching conferences. And it's actually done in other coach that we open up the uh, panel of coaches to the floor that you guys can ask anything you want. And we'll try to make sure that one of them gets a good answer to you. And sometimes we're going to give you different answers because nothing is absolute in, in our sport. There's always going to be different variables. Okay, before we go further, I'm going to introduce, we have Frank Bufa on the far left over here from Canada. <laughs> Carol Dorn Ballard, she's the director of USBC Coaching. <laughs> from Texas. We have Dale Ward, the vice president of Cable Training Center from Florida. Elon Ma from Finland, the Cortain Training Center in Finland. So we will open up the floor to questions. Okay, we're done. <laughs> Coaching. I just have to look up. What is the cost of it? 
when it, there is no cost, okay. purchase of the, of the manual is $25, but there's no cost of completing the domains. Okay. It's just when you come to the national validation, and that's $800. Any questions on this? Well, until somebody raises their hand, I have something else I can announce. Um, I took place in a great meeting this week with the International Coaching Hall of Fame and Museum. How many here internationally are, are familiar with that? Oh my God, look at all the hands go up. Well, what we have is that we used to have a National Coaching Hall of Fame. And Jim Goodwin is in the back of the room. Susie Minshew sits on the committee. Bob Ray and myself. And we are looking to make this an international possible award. And we'd like some feedback from you as to how we can get the word out and spread the word of coaching internationally. So I just nominated Jim Goodwin in the back of the room to answer all your questions. You want to wave, Jim? <laughs> so we just want you to know that we are very passionate about recognizing, recognizing coaches all around the world. Yeah, I was going to say, I've never seen this before in my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, we've spent two days talking about uh, physical game and uh, some of the other adjustments, and uh, we just talked a lot about ball dynamics. But uh, in my opinion, one of the things that's often neglected is, is ball fit. Um, I know that you guys talked about it during your, your, your goal uh, meeting a couple of days ago. I just wanted to get each, each one of your opinions on that. And, So, uh, you know, 
the father of Ipsia back there, uh, one of the fathers, Ron Hoppe, uh, he's got a set, he just told me today in, in his little training, one lane training center, he has a press that only cuts thumbs. And he's another press that cuts balls. He only has, he has one press that just cuts and shakes some more. He is the most passionate fitter I have ever met. And, uh, you know, I've learned a tremendous amount from him. And, uh, and I think Ipsia, you know, has come a long way. Uh, but I, I just think there's so much to know and what can help you with the fit. Uh, especially at the age that the kids are when their hands are changing all the time. So I just sent him, uh, we got a kid coming in from Oregon, a freshman, and I sent him to Ron. I wanted to get, make sure that three or four months before they got to our program, at least he got a good fit, and I knew, I knew his mechanics would change uh, uh, in a positive way, even before Ron was going to actually spend some time with Ron's physical game. So you got, I, think, I believe if you're going to be a goal coach, I think you have to know. To what level? I think that's really the. I think that's really the thing that we're, you're going to try to ascertain. It's not you know what level, but to not know anything, I don't think I don't think you can coach that. Um, okay, you guys are here in the states. You are lucky because you are, you have the only ball drilling education around. Uh, we 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 have Ipsy only. Europe, but once or twice? A couple of times. A couple of times. And what I see actually is, okay, we are teaching what we call modern bowling technique. It has different requirements than, than what it used to be when we were playing with European balls. Nowadays I see way too long spans, way too much reverse thumbs, not enough reverse fingers, and the bowlers are squeezing the ball. When you squeeze squeezing the ball, you cannot swing the way we want you to swing. So we were making a lot more shorter spans, much, much less reverse thumbs and much more, much more reverse fingers to be able to relax the ball, ball relaxed enough. But in general, uh, if coaches need to certify by, by themselves to be able to coach, why not ball drillers also? That's so vital part of our sport. Then again, I totally agree with Frank with the fact that ball drillers have to understand ball reaction also. If you don't understand ball reaction, how can you drill a right ball with the right layout to any, any of your customers? That I, I agree that that's one part that needs to be taken much more thorough consideration. How can we educate the ball drillers? I don't know here, but in Finland we have about, I don't know, 70, 80 ball drillers, maybe five team ones, that actually know the, the latest things about, about ball drillers. A lot, of, a lot of ball drillers have been drilling bowling balls for 30, 40 years. They still drill the balls like they drill the European balls. Uh -huh, I'm not going to work anymore. So we, we really have to do something about it. I just, just follow up on that a little bit too, in my perspective. Uh, there's some basic fittings and then there's advanced fitting and performance fitting. And as your player gets better, you need to have the grip adjusted to check. Because as the grip pressure goes down, you need to make adjustments to that fit. You're only going to get so far with relaxing a swing or taking some muscle out of the swing to how much effort it takes to hold onto that ball. And if the hole size is only holding onto that ball, they're going to be gripping and squeezing it. We want to get to the point that the hole size is the least important part of that fit, that the ball staying on their hands because of pitch. And they don't think about letting go of the ball, the ball just comes off. And that's what we need to be striving for. And it's going to come from you, the coaches. You need to educate your students. Your students need to almost educate the pro shop that this is not acceptable. Because they go to that pro shop, and the pro shop fits them and says, how's it feel? It like, feels good. It feels great. They get another ball, how's the last ball? It feels okay, because they don't know any different. You know, I think almost, we talk about educating the pro shop operator. I think we need to educate our students to what they should tolerate, what they should accept. And as you, you can only go so far, we get it here in the training center without making pitch adjustments. And you know, going from an eighth reverse to threes forward, it's like, oh my God, that's a lot. But until you see a person put on their hand, it's amazing how much difference it can make. So in your stuff that we handed out, we had a fitting chart, a troubleshooting chart in there about you know red flags and you know what are possible causes. Um, I just see so many people have uh, calluses and everything on their hand and they think it's acceptable. But if you were a runner, you wouldn't put up with that would happen into your feet, you'd get rid of those shoes. So we need to start teaching our students that not acceptable either. I think I had a question and over here. 
Good afternoon. I'm going to change the gears a little bit. And okay, one, one sec. Are you going to keep on the same gear before we change? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get to the same gears and we'll change. Yeah. Okay, some advice then. In my town, there's two certified ball drillers. One was certified 25 years ago, and I'm the other one. And we got five pro shops. I don't own a pro shop. When I have my students come in, and their pitches are terribly off, and I send them to the pro shop, like you just said, they're all the best pro shops, they're all the best drillers they have, and nobody knows any more than them. And I don't own a pro shop. But the fits are terrible, and their hands are coming back bruised, they're callous. How do I go about getting them to change their, the way they're doing things? I try to want to talk to them, but they obviously think they know more than me because I don't have a pro shop. So how do we get them to realize, hey, lift these hands. You're tearing these hands up, and none of them went through any type of training to know the difference. I, I, I would, uh, you're the coach. You gotta tell the pro shop what you want. Okay, but you gotta make sure that the guy works with you to make those changes. Because you are the coach. But the pro shop looks at I have a two hundred dollar one ball, I drilled it up and I just spent time on this. And they don't want to go back and say, you know, this is the way I do it. And they're not too receptive of that. That's why I think it needs to be an IPSIA or some type of USBC, somewhere you can down and hold these pro shops more accountable. Well, what, what I, I think you got to find out which one you can work with first, okay. you know, yeah. and, and work with them. Right. And if he's willing to do that, then good. If the other ones, then just let them go. Uh, my advice would put in also to pack your kids to the car and try to the pro shop that listens to you. That, that is certified. So you can always, always the best thing is to walk, walk with your boy. If, if, if you're not paying them, if you're not bringing the money, walk. They, they eventually they will start to listen. I can't, I can't send the people an hour, eight hours down the road to the next pro shop. But if they're better, then they can play. Yes, you can. Okay. I, I mean, not, honestly, it's, it's one of those things that you, you either want to fit right, right or you don't. And, and one of the key, we talked about this all the time the other day, we talked about it in bowling all the time, communication, not only between the bowler and the pro shop, it, it's your relationship between the coach, the bowler, the pro shop, and the proprietor. If we don't all start getting along and understand <laughs> each other, we're going to be sitting in this room in two, four, eight years, and we're going to be talking about the same thing. Right. It's all about communication, and there's a way to just not make everything so derogatory, just kind of say we're on the same team. Yeah. Uh, IPSIA has a class that was started by Ron Hoppe a few years ago. And it's uh, designed to do exactly what you guys are saying, which is the bridge between uh, HOTS, the basic class, and advanced HOTS, which is what uh, Mo originally designed. And that is a class, it, and I think they've changed the name, but it used to be called HOTS on the Lane. So Ron Hoppe uh, started it, then Lou Marquez and I came and wrote the rest of the curriculum. And it's designed to get the pro shop operator to learn more about coaching on the lane and it's designed to get the coaches to learn more what they have to know in the pro shop world, specifically what we're talking about. So there is a, you know, a class that's designed to exactly talk about what you're doing, but in your case, if you can, try to take that person to somebody that you think is reputable, because as soon as they get an experience and they feel something different and they see something different, guess what they're gonna do? When they go home, they're gonna tell a bunch of people, right. And when that pro shop starts to lose this, they're going to be motivated to do something. And I see Ron shaking his head back. You bet. <laughs> yeah, money. Money will give them money. Not the equipment you guys have, but I study different fitting as well. And do you think there's a, how much margin of error do you think is really there? Because you, you, you study different techniques and they arrive at different conclusions. And you know each each person or each founder of that technique will say it's the most accurate or the best, but you know there's some quite a bit of differences. And do you think there's a margin of error there that as long as we get you know we should tr strive for a safety window? Uh, yeah, there is, and it also it, there's definitely a margin of error. 
we have something called tape helping. <laughs> <laughs> now, and I'm saying that to be semi funny, so I guess you guys will laugh, but seriously, I mean, the hand changes, and you have suction grips now, so that when your fingers go up and down, they're, they're, there's a range, certainly. But also, it has to do with who's, who's your player? You know, are they a beginner? Um, because the fit for a beginner, even if it's a fingertip, is going to be different, as Rod said, than an advanced player. Um, you know, first of all, I, I want to get them out of it so that, you know, the first time somebody hangs in the ball, chances are they're probably going somewhere else. Um, because, again, I hate to quote the master over here, but, you know, sometimes you get one shot at customers. Most of the time, you only get one shot at them. And if you don't get them the first time, they're going somewhere else. So, yes, there's a knock and bear. Um, can they repeat a shot? Will the thumb timing allow them that ball to get off their hand at the bottom of the swing, as Bill Taylor said, that the ball holds on to you, you don't hold on to the ball. And if I see, you know, the ball come off early and the ball come off late, and now we have to rely on thumb size too much, I know we have to make a change. Regardless of who flo whose philosophy it is. Okay? Because all that is is a different way to measure the hand. You know, in the in the end, the functionality of the group is the same. Thank you. My remarks are more a comment as to what's being said. When I first started coaching at the university, I had a young lady come to me and she couldn't throw uh, a ball that would hook or anything. I looked at her stand. I had gone to Gibson, so I had a pretty good idea of what was going on. It was drilled left-handed for a right-hander at the pro shop in that bowling center. So, of course, we went in and we talked. Oh, no, I didn't do this. You know, and of course, the people are saying, yeah, you did. <laughs> but to make a long story short, we have four bowling centers. I only used one pro shop driller. He, as far as I was concerned, no one else. Uh, I, I didn't trust anyone else. All right. I'm going to change gears a little bit. Um, those of you that know me know I'm more real passionate about things that I do within this industry. So this question is for you all. You all? <laughs> you all. I used to live here two years. <laughs> Given the massive turnout for this great event, and I have to say it's a great event because since I got here on Thursday night, it's been nothing but hearing great information, sharing information, meeting great people, renewing uh, relationship with old people or old friends, not old people. <laughs> 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 okay. My question is this to you for comments. What do you hope will happen after this great event? What do you want to see happen? Okay, uh, very good question. Um, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dream to see see this happening here. And uh, we had a bet uh, with uh, Rod, uh, where he said to me that at the beginning, he said, we're lucky if we get 40 people. And I said, well, I bet you we get a minimum 60. So we we lost we we lost <laughs> money. So anyways, it's great to see so many people with passion here for coaching. I mean, this is amazing. And all I can say is I wish we had these in the, in the, in the 60s and the 70s. Because bowling wouldn't be in, uh, at this state right now. So congratulations for everybody for being here. And I think we are the, next, the group that can, can do, do something for bowling all together. So uh, give yourself a hand and I think it's great. Thank you. to take this knowledge back. What I'd like to see is more unity among our federations, our countries, in working together to make all of our programs the best they can be. Um, bowling, bowling, as in I'm sure every sport, but I'm not as familiar in some, we tend to become very territorial. We, we become very protective of, of what we're doing and, and what we're saying. And I think the time has come, and with this weekend alone, we should show you that this is the time where change can happen. You can't be afraid of it. It may not work out, but we have to embrace it. And we need to leave here and pass the word of what we've learned 
and start working together and actually share more information so that we don't just get stronger here in the United States, but we get stronger worldwide. And that's from every level, youth all the way up to the seniors. It doesn't matter what type of goal you are. We're there to coach everyone. But I'd like to see stronger federations, stronger relationships, and the sharing of more information. I'm glad to see you go weaker because you can steal, steal all our wheels. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, just, I just refer back to Coach Borden who opened the session and he really just talked about us learning more and for us to go and, and get new bowlers. Uh, I think it's at number 10 or 20 or 25. And I think that's really the point of it. If we have increased skill, increased knowledge to where I'm a big believer that all of all of us are salespeople for bowling, and so if you can't inspire someone, to me, it, 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 you, you can't get them in this game. So passion will carry you a long way. And now that you have new information, that you can teach better timing and get people better faster. Now they can get into the game and enjoy the game better and faster, and get them into the sport, which is what Coach Borden was talking about all along. So. That's really the connective tissue that I, I want to see come out of this. Uh, the way I see it is that uh, the way I handle, uh, look at the picture is that uh, information without experience is not knowledge. It's just information. So the thing is that put the, in, put the, put the information you get here, put it into action. Uh, in, in general, what I see, okay, for us it's different where we're, we're coaching full tough time, so, so we, we coach a lot. But in general, for example, in Finland, I'm, I'm kicking my, my coaches in the park. We coach more and more. Because you, get, you, you can only get the experience by doing it. Okay, information is one thing. But if, once you get the information and you turn it into practice, then it becomes knowledge. So, uh, Coaching is uh, coaching experience is not measured in years. It's measured in hours. How many hours you're spending on the legs? That's the only way you get the experience. Okay. If, in today's bowling world, we need uh, coaches need a lot of information because the fact is that your students can act, have access to the information. They can go to YouTube. They can go to internet find find information. The thing is, your your job is to uh, use that information and put it into practice because for them, they don't have the understanding of the information. Your job is to, to make it reality, the information. That's my words. Okay, uh, I just want to add to, I'm just glad you all came uh, and approved myself and Frank wrong about how many were actually going to show up. Mm -hmm. But give me some history of this. There was a summit in Milwaukee, I think it was 2008, 2009, where they brought a bunch of international coaches in and tried to get things started, and that kind of got dropped. And then going to the I coach got the enthusiasm and the passion going again and started planning this thing. Our plan on this is to have it happen every two years, so we're going to try to do it every even year. Uh, the zones like I coach will be the odd years, you know, it's going to be in Europe and stuff because we have to get that information out there. One thing that we do with the schedule, you'll notice the breaks are extremely long. That's where the real learning happens. It's during that 30 minutes between these classes when you guys get together and exchange ideas and discuss. So that's part of the most important part of this whole conference is that networking that you can do in that 30 minutes. So uh, utilize it. We only have one more day left. I had a question in that person. I'd like to congratulate everybody for being here also. I'm, I'm probably one of the few people in this room that's not a coach. I have a, a little different angle on this, but I have been a bowler for over 50 years and writing about bowling for more than 30 years. So I've been around the block a couple of times. And I, I'd like to ask the panel the, the same question I've asked several people in the room already after hearing a lot of the, the things and learning some of the language that all of you speak. Is that, are, do you ever get concerned that based on what our sport is today and what our and, and the numbers that we have and some of them are, have been declining for a long time that the sport has become just a little bit too technical and if and if you do believe that uh, uh, what can we do about that 
uh, I am much more than concerned. If we look at the uh, okay, if we look at the numbers numbers of, of members dropping in each and every single federation at the moment. Then again, at the same time, we see open polling becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, it actually gives us a conclusion that the the product of polling is good. There's nothing wrong with product of polling if there's 300 million people playing bowling every year around the world. But then again, there's a problem with the product of sport polling because those numbers are dropping down. Uh, personally, I'm most concerned about the fact that in today's bowling world, it's much more of a, uh, a fact what the ball can do for you, not what the player can do to the ball. That's something I'd like to see going back. Back, or maybe not, not European balls, but in a way, going back to the situation where it was much more important what the player was able to do to the ball uh, compared to what, what, what today's bowling is, is what the ball can do to you and who is playing in front of you and so on. So I would, I would definitely love to see the, uh, the situation going back 25 years in that matter. That still with European ball, it was more important what the player was able to do with the ball. That's unfortunately not that much back today. Anymore. I think part of the reason why everybody's here is they're concerned. And, uh, uh, this is where I really miss you know, John Davis, that we would really have some really cool conversations. And he was a pretty in-depth thinker. And if you guys know some of those conversations, it just wasn't surface. He knew how to peel back the layers and really talk about some of the things, um, like a team not being able to go to league or turn anymore and fit in a car, because you, you just can't fit all the bowling balls and, you know, and a team in the car. So the social aspect, the expense of it, um, it's it's really not just about scoring. It's really all of the other things that have happened and the way we used to compete and the way we used to bowl that has changed that really, um, I talk to parents and kids all the time and I can't tell you how many have said, I don't, I can afford this lesson thing. I just can't afford this bowling ball thing. And when they get in there and they realize that, you know, um, you gotta spend, it's an expense and it's an expense that was not there at one time. And if you're not uh, investing in equipment all the time, and as you go up the ladder, um, bowling balls only last for so long. So there's a lot of levels, playing conditions, how to teach it, um, it's confusing. Um, and, and some of the coaches, it's, it's tough to learn transition. It's tough to learn this as a coach, and you're thinking about it 24 seven. So the level of complexity of what you have to know because of all the variables is certainly a challenge. And I've seen people get right to the to the level where they started and they go, you know what, this isn't for me. Um, a lot of people, to be honest with you, they used to take lessons that just disappeared. Um, our college kids, when I wrote a letter to, I can't remember who it was at USBC, I said, our products are sport bowling is so good, how come the majority of the kids that graduate college that have spent all this money over the years, They've taken lessons, they've gone to good competitive universities. When they get out of college, they quit. And Samantha Lender, who went to Wichita State, who grew up at Kegel, three time Team USA member, we had a panel. I brought, we did an experimental league with a, uh, the help of Evan and I. Uh, and they made a, they made, everybody had to use one ball. It was more like a urethane ball. We pulled on different conditions. I did surveys. And at the end, I had a panel. And I asked them, I went around the room, and a whole bunch of different ages, but I had a couple of college kids, and I said, how come you don't bowl? And she, says, and she said, because I know if I don't buy equipment, I don't have a chance. And you're talking about somebody that's bowled since she was you know, four or five years old. So it's, it's not just one thing here. It's not just the complexities. There's a lot of layers of what the game brings today that I think in terms of, at, at some point, becomes a challenge if people want to bowl. Does that make sense? So it's not just high scoring, it's not just all this other stuff. It's a lot of, a lot of things. Um, yes, I'm working. Yeah. Is that the first thing I guess you're supposed to say? But I, I have two takes on that. I'm going to take one as a bowler and one as somebody working in the industry. 
As a bowler, I was told a very, very long time ago, while I was on tour making a living, that the bowler is better than the bowl. Everybody looks at me crazy when I even say that today. I absolutely agree that the bowls are more powerful. I absolutely agree that they, yes, make some bowlers look a little bit better than they do. They don't make them look better, they make them look more better. Big difference. So when that coach said that to me, what did it make me do? I was already a 220 average bowler. I was out on tour. I was in the top five in the world. But it still made me work at my game to be better. So why do we continue to always make excuses as to why our bowlers can't be better? There's nothing we can teach them? I don't believe that. To strive to be the best in the world, you must work out. And eventually there are going to be people who are going to become better. And I, and I use this comment all the time. And Kim's back to chit chat, and she won't remember this, but I walk into her office one day, it was probably six months ago. Yeah, it's longer than that, probably nine. And I'm even going to back up more. The year, last year when I, was a late, not Diana's year, the year before when I made the show at the Queen, I hurt my hand. And eight days before the tournament, I'm just freaking out. And hey, God was just, I changed my pitches from A to Z. And I had eight days to bowl with the ball those pitches. I can't even tell you how dramatic the change was. I mean, I went from under to this. I had no feel. But you know what I did? I worked out. And I had these expectations of where I wanted to be. And the problem is, we have, we have watched everybody get better, and they just said, yeah, you're good. You're good. Instead of looking at them and go, yeah, even though you're scoring well, there, there's some things you need to really fine tune. So I think we're a little bit to blame when we talk about our bowlers and how good they are, because we also have to be realistic <coughs> as to where they're going to be in five years if they lose it. The second part of that is, no matter what age you are, if you're a competitor and you're that higher average bowler, and you have that competitive nature, if you still want to be competitive, you're still going to work at it. You know what you're going to do? You're going to seek out coaching. Because the real competitors do that. So there's going to be a continuation of that for as long as bowling is around. The second aspect of that is that there are a lot of programs available to coaches, bowling centers, pro shops, doesn't matter who you are, that help all levels of bowling. Bowling 2.0, created for the casual bowler. So grow that niche, and then grow them into the league, and then grow them into the bowling. Nothing wrong with that. We just deal with the same bowlers. It's not going to grow the score. We have to embrace the other bowlers as much as some of us may look at it and go, we just don't want to deal with that. But the casual bowlers are our biggest number right now. Let's figure out how to get them and travel them into the next step into bowling. And there are programs